Welcome to Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things, the podcast show. I'm your host, Carrie Roberts, and I have with me yet another ordinary to extraordinary fabulous person in our community. And I have with me Eric Hodgson. He is calling in from Florida. And uh, as I'm sitting here in New Jersey, as I said, hopefully we can continue this conversation without the storm kind of ruining <laughs> the live feed here. But welcome, Eric. So excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Carrie. I am super honored to be speaking with you and to share whatever I can with your audience. This is fantastic. Yeah. And we, you know, this topic is, um, I think, very timely. There's been a lot of things that have been going on. And so I, I do want to kind of dive deep to where you feel comfortable and also talk about kind of actionable steps at the end. But I want to start first when you, when you were young and you were yes. kind of envisioning like your family and your life, like what did you kind of think that that would look like? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, when I was growing up, I wasn't sure that I was going to have a family. I, uh, I had other aspirations to build video games and this was the late eighties and yes, I'm dating myself here, but it was the late eighties and there really weren't many schools to teach people how to build video games. It was, it was really something that took place, uh, out in California at studios or in just somebody's basement when they were building these games. But, um, uh, I, I, I wanted to focus more on a career. And so uh, when I got into my 20s, uh, life has different plans for you. And you meet someone and you fall in love with that person and you get together. And next thing you know, uh, you want to make babies, right? So that's really, um, uh, I think it was such a very natural progression to that point. And, and that's what happened. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. I do not have any children myself, but it's like you said, people sometimes they fall in love, they want to have children, right. they want to have this big family, they have this whole uh, idea of what something maybe should be, and then kind of things can adjust. It's not always exactly what we plan. I don't think anything right. is exactly what we plan. Now, right. before right. we get into to Zoe, was is Zoe your only child? Uh, Zoe is my only biological child. Uh, when I got together with her mom, uh, she already had, uh, two kids from a previous relationship and, uh, they, I didn't formally adopt, but I raised uh, both Zoe's older sister and older brother, um, at the same time. So honestly, we, we never really talked about it being step siblings. They were right. always around each other. And so, uh, we were one family. Yeah. So let's talk about Zoe, you yes. know, when she was born, Yes. the type of person she was and, you know, just the excitement that you had for her when she was a young girl. Uh, Zoe uh, was uh, just a wonderful toddler. I mean, so easy, so inquisitive, um, super funny without trying to be funny. Um, you know, whenever her sister would get scolded about boundaries, Zoe would gently remind her that those are paper towels. Um, right. And so uh, she just had a sense of humor about herself. And and um, she was always about a deep connection at that age, always about a deep connection at that age. If you weren't deeply connected, she gravitated towards those that did have a deep that she'd have a deep connection with. And so um, but just a gentle, gentle little toddler. And uh, growing up, she was always that way. And um, even leading into her teens. Now, I think, you know, um, so she was a teen. What what kind of year was it like being a teenager or like 2000s? Maybe yes. like. Uh, no, actually, 2000? a teenager was uh, 2010 era. 2010. OK, yes. so social media, like it's there. Mm -hmm. It kind of just is beginning. You know, I think about teenagers today and the impact that social media has on them for better or right. worse. Right. When you, you know, when she became a teen and I consider like, you know, 13, when you kind of go right. through the changes, middle school, right. you get moody and everything else and you have the <laughs> peers and like all the, again, the pluses and minuses of being a right. young teen, um, the confusion of it all. Did you kind of notice a change in her as a teen? Like, did she, was she involved in some of the early social media did, was she somebody that kind of cared what other people thought? Did you kind of notice that shift as she kind of went into teenagehood? That's a great question. Now, Zoe was always a very independent, um, not a follower. She was a leader in every sense of the word. Um, even at an early age, uh, 
people gravitated towards her because of the way that she dealt with life um, in a very uh, different way. You know, she was not about trends. She was about making her own, you know, statement, if you will, and not a rebellious statement at all. It's not, it wasn't about that. It was just about being her own individual self and exploring that. And so um, she tended to gravitate towards her friends who also were very similar in, in the same sense. And so, um, and I really respected that. I really respected that, that time in her life when she uh, would just, Hey, I'm not, I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. I'm going to do, I'm going to march by the beat of my own drum. I might like, go, go and do, you know? So uh, always super proud of her for that. And, and that was very reflective um, into her teens with her friends and some of the new friends that she met along the way. Yeah. I think it's an important quality to have, especially as a young person, because mm -hmm. you do have, like I said, not only just your friends, social media, society, sometimes parents telling you who to be, how to dress. We're now in right. an age of, you know, much more talk about gender, uh, mm -hmm. much more talk about LGBTQ that wasn't around or wasn't talked about, you know, so many years ago and how important right. that is. So, you know, our topic today is navigating through grief. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. your daughter committed suicide around the age of 15. Before yes. we get into that moment, yep. did you notice elements of change? Did you notice elements of depression? Were there signs or were there things that kind of stood out? Because I think that is a question people always, always are looking for mm -hmm. or uh, internalizing if something like this happens to them. Yeah, I think I noticed a change. Um, her mom and I did not stay together. And we split in 2005. And uh, for seven years, it was, you know, just we were just on the schedule. And I would see the girls, uh, Zoe and her sister, um, you know, often and, and on a regular basis. Uh, and sometimes even we would spend extra time together. Um, but uh, when Zoe was about 12 going into 13, uh, that's when I really started to notice a, a, a change, a shift. You know, yes, there was a lot going on in her life as she was entering, uh, leaving middle school, going into high school. Um, but she was still struggling to deal with some situations in, in, uh, at mom's house that were, were, were challenging for her. And, and I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that until I made the decision to have a conversation with the girls that, they just opened up and told me, uh, you know, really what was going on. And I, I needed to step in. I needed to step in and be there for them in a way that I hadn't been able to be for there for them previously. And so, um, and so I did. And uh, uh, I actually went to get custody of Zoe. Um, and and uh, at that point, now, this was seven years after a divorce. It's highly unlikely you know, that, that, that it would change unless there's a problem. And there mm -hmm. clearly was something going on that we were trying to work through. Uh, even though her mom and I were not still together, uh, we were trying to work through this as best possible. And um, a simple ask was not enough. Um, it, it, had to, it had to go into a, a court situation, which that's never pleasant, of course, but you, you do what you have to do um, in terms of taking care of family matters um, and, and to try to preserve as well a family dynamic during all of this. And it's really challenging to do that. And so, you know, if, if obviously anytime there's divorce and there's family stuff going on, mm -hmm. that's hard on everyone involved. Right. And then, like you right. said, middle school, you've got hormonal changes. There's a mm -hmm. lot happening for kids at that age. Um, was she, did you take her to therapy? Was therapy involved? Was there any mm -hmm. diagnosis of any kind? Yes, she'd go to therapy, and uh, Zoe wasn't necessarily d diagnosed as uh, depressed. Um, it was more situational um, mm -hmm. of things that were going on that were, you know, that she was internalizing, I believe. And, and so there was just a, a, it kept on compounding, I believe. And, and so, uh, but she was hospitalized in several situations um, that because of, uh, you know, uh, she was not safe. She was not being safe with herself uh, in, in some ways. And, um, you know, through, um, you know, self-harm and some other ways to cope with what was going on. Um, it just, 
I wanted to do everything I possibly could for her. But as a parent, you're not equipped to be able to deal with some of those things that happen. Um, and so there are professionals that are equipped. And I think even though there was this feeling of this really uh, pit in your stomach feeling of, man, I really don't want her to be in a hospitalization or uh, an adolescent unit. Um, there was something very magical for her and the people that she met, her friends that she met there uh, in these units that, that I would never want to, I wouldn't change it, you know, because you're talking about others that are also around the same age dealing with very similar issues and, and then being able to relate to each other. And, and, you know, that was one thing that was super important for me at that point was that if I'm going to do everything I can for Zoe, that means I need to connect with her on a different level at this point. What did you learn as a parent at that time? You know, if your child is being hospitalized, she's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being unsafe to herself, you know, I would assume there's a lot of anxiety and a, mm -hmm. a moment of like, I want to be around her every second. Right. You know, how did you kind of deal with that? Or what was the suggestion of the medical professionals at that time of what could you do for her? Well, I think a, a parent's love is something that is non-negotiable. It's unconditional. Um, and I, I would like to believe that that's for a lot of parents. And, and sometimes it's not that way. But for me, it was unconditional and it was non-negotiable that I was going to do everything in my power because that's the promise that I made Zoe the day she was born. You know, here's this baby laying in this plexiglass uh, cradle in, in, a, in the room and I'm looking down at her and she must have changed about four different colors in about five minutes. She looked like a chameleon, but that, but, you know, there's this little baby you know, completely helpless. And I said to her, I don't know if, you know, uh, I don't know how, but I'm going to do everything in my power to be the best dad for you. And that came screaming back into my life when she was hospitalized. And so if I wasn't going to get any assistance from, uh, you know, the professionals in whatever case that they weren't able to provide that then me as her dad, I had to be the the one. Um, and yes, other family members as well were there for her, um, uh, you know, and her friends. And so a lot of support um, was there. And so she wasn't without. Um, but I, as a parent, you 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 just don't stop. You don't stop. Um, and that's been probably one of the biggest lessons. Uh, from, uh, you know, being hospitalized. I've had other parents call me and, and tell me that their kids like, eh, you know, it, it, we've tried everything we, we, we could, it's just not working out. So we've resigned ourselves to the fact that probably within the next day or two, our kid's going to like, what? No, 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 yeah. no. You don't stop. If you have to stay awake and hold your child's hand at night while they're sleeping and, and take, you know, about 42, uh, well, all right, that's not true. Take a couple of those no-dos, right. <laughs> you know, to stay awake and drink a Mountain Dew, whatever. But you, you know, it's really important that you are available for your child in, in their, 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 their most vulnerable and, and challenging times because they're scared. They're, they're simply scared and, and they just need to know that somebody has got their back. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said. Did she, you know, at that point kind of open up to you at all and kind of talk about how she was feeling or what was going on? Was she able to kind of verbalize at all to you or to her friends or to anyone else? Yeah, she certainly verbalized to her friends. Um, I I mean, it's, it, but it was different. It wasn't so much that like, hey, um, you know, they got it. They understood kind of what she was dealing right. with. Uh, especially the friends in the, in the, in the units. Um, and to me, I think that because I'm dad, there was a protection there. Zoe didn't want to appear like she was burdening me with anything. And I can just tell you as a parent, it's never a burden when your child, you want to take your child's pain away in whatever way possible. And sometimes it's frustrating when things happen. And sometimes it's not the prettiest, you know, of responses. It's only because when you care, you get emotional. We are emotional yeah. creatures. And so um, 
uh, there were times that she did open up and there were times when she didn't. And I think for Zoe, she was just trying to figure things out, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and so uh, I, you know, there was still therapy involved. There was other, uh, you know, other uh, resources, if you want to call them uh, resources that were available. And she uh, took advantage of uh, in a very positive way. And art was her big thing. Art and music were her yeah. go-to things. And so we found out very soon that, you know, the more music that she made, the more grounded that she was. And so her, one of her art teachers uh, at the therapeutic uh, school that she was in um, uh, actually took her into a studio and recorded some, some music. And um, I, it's one of the best gifts I think I've, I've ever received in my life to hear those, you know, hear my daughter singing. Yeah. So I, I love that. And I, um, uh, I'm a dancer and I always say art is always very healing. There's something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very meditative about it. That's different than other things. Um, yes. it works a different part of your brain and the creativity. And so yeah. it's wonderful to hear that she had those moments that art really helped her through those tough times. Yeah. In fact, those two, the painting here of mm -hmm. the Buddha, that's Zoe painted that for me. That's and nice. The one down here is also a Buddha's uh, face. And so um, I heard she had incredible talent. Her, uh, you know, her mom, her sister and her brother are all also very talented. I don't claim any of that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can draw a stick figure like anybody else. Right. But that might even look off. But, you know, but, yeah. but she's just a fantastic artist. And I just absolutely love the creativity. I loved what it did, you know, did for her. Mm hmm. No, that's wonderful. You know, I, uh, we, you, you speak and you write and you kind of talk about this journey. And I was reading a little bit, uh, on your website about, um, the day that she committed suicide. And I, I yes. feel like the way you wrote it, I was like, first of all, it was only like a couple paragraphs, which mm -hmm. was interesting. Cause I was like, how much is said in just mm -hmm. a few short words? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what you want to share to whatever extent, um, of that moment or that day, or mm. like, did you feel like this was coming? Cause she had been hospitalized, like anything that you want to talk about, about that moment or that day or the day after. No, I think uh, I appreciate you asking. And, and, you know, this is all at hindsight's always 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I know that when we lose a loved one, especially to suicide, or even when we lose a loved one in general, you know, there's 500 plus thousand people that have, um, you know, that did not make it through COVID. Uh, yep. you know, in just the last year. And it's not just those 500,000 people, but there's a minimum or an average of six people per person that have to go through the loss. You know, that's the, the six. And I think that number is low. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think that number is from the CDC uh, about who would actually have to deal, deal with the loss. And so take that and multiply. So, you know, 3 million people are dealing with the loss of a loved one in the last 12 months. Um, and then forget a suicide by itself. There's 44, at least 20, uh, in, in 2014, I think, uh, 2015, there were, uh, 44,000 people in this country alone that took their mm -hmm. life and that's just this country. And so, um, and so, uh, but you know, the, the, I did not see it coming. Um, Zoe was, uh, living at a halfway home and she was able to come home and see me sometimes on the weekends, but I love those weekends because we would sometimes go to the beach in the middle of winter and we'd freeze our hands by picking up cold, wet, sandy rocks, or Zoe would be up in her room for hours listening to some music, um, playing her ukulele or uh, just uh, burning some jasmine incense. And so uh, this one particular weekend, I did pick up Zoe and brought her back to my house and she was upstairs in her room uh, listening to some music and she was texting with a couple of friends and, and she was applying this really cool henna tattoo on her hand with a sun design on it. And I went upstairs and asked her, Hey, Zozo, you want to call some friends? And she's like, I really don't have any dad. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I pushed back a little bit. I'm like, I, I, I don't know about that, but well, okay, why don't we make some food then? She's like, cool. So afterwards we were cleaning up and she said, I'm really tired, dad. I'm going to go to bed now. And I said, okay, pumpkins, I love you. And she replied, I love you too, dad. So I'm back at my computer to do some work for a little while. And I head upstairs to say goodnight. And when I open up Zoe's door, 
I can hear Jonathan Frushanti's guitar playing on the stereo. And there's a string of Christmas lights that, that, that are lit around the perimeter of her room, but she's not in her bed. And out of the corner of my eye, I can see that she's standing in her closet. And I am so convinced that she's about to jump out and scare me. And I'm like, Zoe, what are you doing? The problem was she wasn't standing in her closet. All I could do was call 911. About five days later, over 900 people came to Zoe's wake. Carrie, 900. I mean, that just blows me away. Um, her friend Sarah came up and she was just sobbing. And all I could do was put my arm around her and say, look, sweetie, it's going to be okay because Zoe would want you to remember all those good times that you had together, right? And then another friend, Kelly, came up and she said, I am so sorry, Mr. Hodgson. Uh, I don't get it. Zoe was so nice and she was always smiling. I don't get it. And I like, I was like, I don't get it either, sweetie, but it's going to be okay. I think the next two weeks were an absolute blur. Um, it to me was too unbelievable to be believable. Um, there are many moments where there was just a, I, you know, I can flash back to a memory and, and I think that this is a very, uh, this is a moment when your, uh, your memory kind of takes over and you have just incredible attention to the details of the things that are going on. Some people have that. Some people just, you know, it just blocks right out because it's traumatic. And yes, this was traumatic. And, um, but something very amazing happened with her friends. I think in the week after Zoe died, uh, before we got to the wake and the funeral, um, her friends were at the house and they all stayed over and we talked and we laughed and we talked about Zoe and it, we were all at moments just, you know, catching ourselves because we were realizing that she wasn't there. And, and in a lot of ways, seven years on, I feel like Zoe was there um, in so many ways, energetically, you know, energy doesn't die. And so um, I feel like she was with us in, in whatever capacity that was. Um, and so <clears throat> it was, uh, it was a defining moment in my life. Um, I had to survive it and I didn't know how I was going to do it. In fact, the night riding home from the ER that night, my sister came and she picked me up and, and I'm, it's about a three mile drive from the hospital to back to my house. And, and I have got my hand on the seatbelt, holding it so tight. And I just like, I'm hanging on to like a rope and, and, you know, just like I, I, I said to her, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. And she said, we'll find a way, you know, and that was really it. And so uh, the journey began. I was placed on a journey that I didn't uh, ask to be on. None of us really asked to be on it when we lose a loved one. Um, and I feel as though resources out there today are focused on survival as being the end game, just, just get through surviving and, and that'll be enough. I don't know about that. We are, we are not meant to live out the rest of our days in survival mode. We're, you know, survival mode is meant to be temporary anyway. Uh, but I do believe there's a way that you can survive first, then get back up, have better days and eventually live beyond your loss. And that's where I'm at right now. Well, I thank you for sharing that very personal and, and descriptive story, um, because as you as you said offline, you know, I've it's been seven years, almost eight. Mm -hmm. I've talked about this enough. Um, doesn't make it, you know, not challenging, I'm sure, sure. to kind of think about it, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to kind of um, walk us through a little bit how you dealt with the grief, because as you mm -hmm. said, losing anyone is hard. Yes. But there's, I would assume like there's a difference if you lose someone to cancer versus mm -hmm. a car accident mm -hmm. versus suicide versus COVID mm -hmm. there's, you know, seeing someone do it a lot, you know, a long time, a short time set, you know, there's a, a lot of differences I would assume, yeah. even though the element of grief is there yeah. with this happening, like you said, it was a blur, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you and your ex-wife weren't together, but now you've got to, I assume, come together in mm -hmm. kind of a new way. Mm -hmm. 
How did you kind of maneuver maybe those first few weeks, first few months of grief? So if somebody's listening to this and mm -hmm. they're in that spot, like what did you do? Any actionable step or just describe, you know, what it was like? Well, I, I appreciate that. And so I know that, you know, you were just saying initially that, you know, there's, uh, there's other people that have lost loved ones. And so I believe that grief is like a fingerprint that there are so many similarities between your fingerprint and mine, but our experience is what's different. And so when you have conversations with those who have lost a loved one, um, you know, we're looking for guides along the way that will tell us what's up ahead so that we can either be prepared for it or know that it's not, this is not permanent. Right. And so, um, in the first couple of weeks, though, you are in this brain fog, this uh, blur, as I call it, that you're not sure which way to go, what to do, how to be. Um, you're not sure if you, it's okay to laugh. You know, uh, you certainly are, are feel like it may be okay to cry, but maybe you can't. Um, you may be angry. Emotions are just coming up. You may have a tremendous sense of guilt that mm -hmm. you didn't do enough. Yep. For your loved one, whether it was cancer, whether it was suicide, whether it was COVID, whether it was, you know, um, maybe I should have said that one last thing, or maybe I should have done this one last thing. Um, in my experience, we have said and we have done everything that we could do for our loved one. There's always more to say. There's always more to do, of course. Um, but this was not your doing. And, and so at finding the ways to deal with that early on is to give yourself some grace, give yourself permission to go through whatever you're feeling and, and let it, let yourself know that this is just part of, there's no timeline for grief. There's no one right way to walk a path. And so as you take each step every day, because we don't know what's in front of us, um, even, even from a day-to-day -day basis in our regular lives, we don't know what's in front of us as we're driving down the road. We don't know what's in front of us when we walk into the work for that day. We don't know what's in front of us at the grocery store, right? We just have to take one step at a time. And with grief, it hurts so much. We don't want to be there, mm -hmm. right? We just don't, we just want to, we just want to leave it behind and you just can't shut it off. And so there are practical ways that you can deal with those early days and weeks to include movement, walking, um, uh, breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is wonderful for emotional help. Um, reduces your a sympathetic state where you're at fight, flight, or freeze mode when you're overwhelmed down to a calm and connect when you're doing diaphragmatic breathing. That's something I've been practicing for a few years now, and it has helped me and my clients tremendously when they when they're struggling. Um, so yeah, that's really you know the, the beginning. It's just giving yourself some grace, Carrie, to to be able to to know that this is going to be a process, and that there are other people out there who have walked the path who can help you and walk with you. You know, there was, I don't know who said it, and I'm sure you've heard this term, uh, that when you lose a parent, you lose your past. When you lose mm -hmm. your partner, you lose your present. When you lose a child, mm. you lose your future. How, wow. you know, again, we're talking not only about different types of loss, yes. but in that sense, you know, like you said, oh, she would have been what, 22 at this yeah. point or right, so. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you deal with that too? then and on a daily basis of like, this person would have been growing up, they would have been maybe yeah, finishing right. college. How do you deal yeah, with yeah. that? Because it's different than like I said, a parent or a partner. It is. Uh, and that's a great observation. Just a couple of days ago, I saw a post from one of Zoe's friends that she was graduating with her bachelor's degree. And I just, wait a minute, four, it's been four years, you know, for them for high school already, uh, you know, from graduation. And and I often talk to some of her really good friends and we just, I, I just say to them, it's like, it's so it's, it's, it is odd because, you know, Zoe to me is always going to be 15 mm -hmm. and yet here they are at 22, 23 
Well, how, you know, how are they going to be at 40? Am I going to still look at them? I'm still going to look at them as Zoe's friends, no matter how old I am or they are. Right. But Zoe's always going to be 15. And I think they're always going to hold a very special place in their, in their heart for her. Um, and so um, she left an impact on them that I believe Zoe did more in her 15 years than most people do in 90. You know, she, I don't think that she had any regrets and I'm not, I am not condoning taking one's life. I think that she was in tremendous pain. This was the, she, she wanted to end the pain. She didn't want to end her life. Mm -hmm. And so there are options. There's, you know, that is one option. That's not the, the best option. There are typically other options that can be, uh, you know, put on the table that are much more constructive uh, to, to helping you come back from the edge. And, and I've worked with many people on that uh, same thing when they've been at that point where it's like, why, why bother? Why, why do I care? Even folks that are trying to survive the loss of a loved one, Carrie, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're like, why, why do I care? Why should I feel better? They're not in my life anymore. Why do, why should I care? And I get that because I've had those very same feelings, but here's what I know to be true. It will be okay when you choose to make one decision and that is to get back up. Now, how you get there, you don't snap your fingers. It is a process. It is a journey. Um, but you have to decide every single day whether you're going to survive or not. And it's not easy. Um, I feel like it takes a lot of time. And, and sometimes it does require more tears than there are tissues for, you know, but I, I had to work through all of that. I did not skip any stages of it. I didn't avoid the grief. It was hard. I had resources. I had people that were with me, whether it be my therapist, whether it be a coach, whether it be um, family and friends, Zoe's friends. We would mm -hmm. check up on each other. Hey, how you doing? You doing all right? Yeah. How about you, Eric? You doing okay? I'm, I'm doing good. You know, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to work through it. And we would talk things out. And then they would realize that I'm working on it just like they were. And so they felt like there was somebody with them in the process. And so I am happy to say that eight years, oh, seven and a half years later, that not one of her friends followed suit. And there were some that were struggling on, you know, at the edge there. So um, uh, I, I don't credit, it's not me, it was them. They did the work. And so there's a collective, um, there's some collective uh, of support there that's very beneficial for people that uh, when you're struggling, even when you're alive, you know, even when you're alive, when you think you've got no options and that nobody's going to get you, you're, I'm a burden to everybody, you know, I might as well just, no, there are things that, that can actually, you can take care of a lot of those things um, just sitting down and talking with somebody. And by the way, there is more strength in that coming forward than, than not. Yeah. And I think, you know, in talking to someone, it doesn't always have to be someone you're close with. Like right. I, when I do these, you and I just met, you know, when you do these kind of um, interactions, sometimes people do feel uh, easier connected with someone they don't know as well. Cause there's right. no judgment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so that's kind of helpful as well. I think one of the things that is one of the many things that is also challenging about grief is there's two, these two pieces, right? So it happens, someone passes away, there's all these mm -hmm. flowers, everyone's there. And then it's like a month goes by and, and everyone's moved on. Yep. And you're like, what? I'm still here. You know, like, right, how do right. you, how did you deal with that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what, what did you need maybe from the people around you mm -hmm. to get them to, I mean, they're never going to fully understand, but to just no. understand of like, Hey, I'm, I'm not there yet, you know? Sure. And I appreciate that as well. I mean, I heard, um, I did get to that point. It was probably two weeks after Zoe died and I was sitting in my living room. Everybody had gone home. My house mm -hmm. was full for two weeks and slowly people started to go back to their lives and I'm sitting in my couch and the silence is deafening. It, it was so strange. And uh, I had a, a little, uh, I mean, I probably cried for two hours that day. Um, and just like, what am I going to do? You know, uh, you're, you're, uh, you just want this. You want to turn the clock back. You want to fix what is unfixable. And 
I think that what really got me through that was one, knowing that uh, I did have some others in my life that, uh, and I was doing this myself because it helped me in the same at the same time. But I would outreach to Zoe's friends, "Hey, how are you doing?" When I was feeling so low that I just wanted to stop and just like I would like, no, I I I need to, I don't want to do this because that's going to keep me stuck here. And yes, I'm sad and it's okay to feel that, but I would do, I would probably go through the list of like 10 or 15 friends. Hey, text them. Hey, how you doing? You doing okay? That simple act of asking how they were doing was what they needed in the moment. And it's what I needed in that moment. And so you can do that from afar. If you are a relative or a friend of someone who's lost a loved one, or if you've lost a loved one, it's okay to ask for what you need. Like you were saying, Carrie, great question. Um, and that's, and it's okay to tell people what you need. You might be able to say, Hey, I just need to be alone right now. In fact, a a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of my coaching clients called me up and told me that her second child, um, took their life, um, Mm -hmm. just six months after her brother died from a heart, um, a heart, a heart issue. Oh my goodness. And so I, that's my first question to her is I said, what do you need from me right now? And she said, I just want to know somebody is on the other end of the line. And, and I, I said, I will keep checking in. And so every time I do outreach to her on a daily basis, how are you doing? How are you doing? And she'll sometimes tell me I'm doing okay. And that's it. Other times she'll, and look, when somebody is, when you ask that question, I would advise and suggest, not advise, that's kind of a, I don't want to tell people what to do. Um, it's, I think it's important for those to, um, uh, to remind people of what's important. And when you are uh, asking somebody how they're doing, you are giving them support. Um, it is way better, way better than somebody saying, call me if you need anything, or I'm right over here, just let me know if you need anything. Nobody's going to call you when you say that, um, because they, you know, at that, at that time you are vulnerable, you are struggling. You need to know that people have your back. And so by just simply saying, Hey, how are you doing? It goes so far in the realm of supporting. Yeah. I think that's an important point because I, I, you know, uh, my boyfriend lost his mom to COVID in January Mm. and it was like, and, uh, she was in a different country. He was in a different Mm -hmm. country at the time. So here I am like, he's in a different country. And I'm like, what do I do? You know what I mean? And same thing, like you said, you're kind of like, what do you need? But then you're Mm -hmm. trying to say, are you okay? And sometimes you're not getting a response and then you're worried and you're like, I'm not sure. Um, Mm -hmm. and like you said, everybody grieves differently. And, and sometimes people say, I just need space. Um, because I need just a moment to clear my head with all people asking questions, what happened, what, you know, and you're repeating yourself. You're like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And, um, you know, when you hear that, you forget like how many times sometimes people are bombarded and I'm sure you did too. What happened and how many times like, you're probably like, I'm done telling this story. Yeah, I I did. And and I just, you know, how is your, how is your boyfriend doing right now? I mean, overall much better. I think, um, you know, it's, I don't want to speak for him because it's his personal story, but, uh, you know, as a person, he's a very strong person and he Mm -hmm. did everything he could, but it's still, like Mm -hmm. you said, it's like, you're like, could something else have been done? Um, when we talk about too, with COVID, uh, our country is a little bit better in our healthcare system than some Mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So there's that component too. You know, if this person was here, would it have been better? You kind of go through your mind, uh, just like you were saying, what have I done? this or what if this had happened Mm -hmm. um and the challenge of of that as well so yeah i think he's doing much better um but you know it's i'm sure it's 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 day by day yeah it is day by day and that's it you know and i think the way you're looking at that and supporting him and being there for him asking him what he needs um that's another great question what do you need from me right now Mm -hmm. you know that's a great way to support a family member or a friend or somebody who's lost someone and and they'll tell you Hey, I just don't, I don't need anything right now. I just want to be left alone. Okay, cool. That's okay. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, um, uh, nobody's going to burden you with their pain. You can't take it on anyway. You know, there's no difference between real and imagined trauma. Our brains process it the same way. 
And so, uh, like you and I were talking before we started uh, started the session here, it's like I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, you're right, you can't because if you do, your brain thinks that it's happening, and so you're you're protecting yourself with that. And so, um, you know, you talk about how people ask you a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, I remember at the wake. Uh, the, you know, the line was just, I was stood there for five hours. I would have stood there for another five if more people came in, but they had to shut the doors. And, um, towards the end of the night, uh, uh, a woman came in with her, uh, teenage daughter. I think it was, she knew Zoe from somewhere. Daughter couldn't speak at all. She was just so distraught and I was focusing on her. But as soon as, soon as the mom, uh, mom got in front of me, she's like, what I need to know what happened. <laughs> I You're like, now because, is not the time. <laughs> well, I mean, I kind of did that, but I, I understand why she was saying that because her daughter was struggling. And so she wanted to be able to prevent that from happening with her daughter. And I get it, but you're right. The time I said, I, I'm really, you know, not, not prepared to talk about that right now. Mm -hmm. Just, I just know that Zoe is okay and it, it's going to be okay. Like I, I mm -hmm. just, and so um, we have to give grace to ourselves uh, in, in those moments. And, and I think that, uh, you know, we, we just need to do everything possible to be there for the ones that we love. And, and if you do, are you, if you are on the other side of losing a loved one, then, um, it is okay to, uh, you know, to, to focus on what you need in that moment. Um, or if it's not day by day, then it could be hour by hour or minute by minute. Um, but, if you want to find meaning for your life, if you want to find meaning for, you know, why did this have to happen? You may never get those answers, but you can certainly say, well, you know, what can I do about it now? You know, And I'd love for you to talk a little about what you are doing about it now, because like mm. you said, almost seven and a half years later, Yes. How have you kind of, once you kind of worked through your grief, you know, again, anytime we lose someone, there's always yes. going to be moments and triggers, obviously, right. um, but in a better place now, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, what have you, what has it kind of empowered you to do at this moment? Uh, uh, another fantastic question, Carrie. Um, you know, I, I think for the first couple of years, it was just getting through day by day, uh, getting my feet beneath me so I could stand back up and, and, and look forward to some better days and honor at Zoe at the same time. I didn't know how I was going to do that though. That was the thing. And so um, uh, I was invited to attend a men's leadership event in Dallas and uh, I was introduced to a story coach and he invited us to come out to California and go through a three-day workshop to learn how to tell our story. I'm like, I want to tell the story of Zoe, not so much what happened to her, but who she was as a person and why she would be so pissed off with me if I wasted all those good memories of her life by not living mine. And so I, I, that's what I started. I started to work on story. And here's the thing, and I didn't know this at the time, but humans are wired for story. We've been telling stories since before there was language. And so whenever, if you remember when you were a kid, hey, mom, tell me that story again, we can listen to stories over and over again because there's a healing component to it. So if you're struggling with the loss of a loved one, there is some catharsis, there is some healing associated with telling and sharing that story. You know, what did you learn in the process of this? What did you learn when you've had loss in your life? You know, I, I, I wonder for your boyfriend, what, is, what has he learned in the last few months, eight, uh, six, eight months since losing his mom about himself? Because we're drawn yeah. to that, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I mm -hmm. think also with men, that's also interesting as well, because men generally deal with emotions differently. Mm -hmm. um, I do know as a person, he, if he's feeling stressed, he likes to be by himself as a female. I'm like, I want to talk about it. <laughs> I want to have a discussion about it. Right. Um, so it's, you know, it's, we're all wired differently, um, as people, but also sometimes as male or female. Right. Um, so sometimes it is, you know, some people I'm an over communicator. I could talk about 50 million ways that I feel at this moment. And yeah. some people have a hard time really labeling how they're feeling or how they're growing right. and they can't do that. And so it's like you said, it's, it's interesting to kind of have those conversations and how do you be there for that person without forcing something because that's what you want, you know, versus yeah. what they need. 
Yeah. And sometimes people will, I, I remember going back to work about two and a half months afterwards and it was only part time. And by the way, the company I was working for at the time was absolutely phenomenal with, um, you know, it was such a clear difference of, of leadership uh, working with this new, I was only there for three months and then Zoe died. And so my boss is like, it doesn't matter. Take as much time as you need. We'll cover your pay. We'll cover therapy. We will help you in whatever way we can support you. And that, that meant the world to me. And when I did come back part-time about two and a half months later, um, I remember sitting there with my, my work colleague and a uh, fantastically good dude. He was just a, a good friend, a good listener. That's, I think, what was key. And so I would just sit there and I'd sit there and I'd be thinking about it. And I'd be like, God, it's so weird. Grief is weird. Because, you know, you could have a few good moments and then some memory pops in back in your head and you're boom, you're back on your, you know, you're back down to sobbing and it's very quick. And so, um, I, but I think the fact that he was a good listener really helped. And, and so just recognizing that you're going to be, is your brain is trying to process the loss and the grief, uh, your emotions are tied into that. Um, and so you're going to feel everything. You're going to have happy memories of your loved one. And those sad memories eventually do get replaced with happy memories and funny things that you used to do with them. And, um, uh, and I'd like to keep pictures of Zoe around. I've got a whole stack of photos here, um, that I look at often and every once in a while I'll be like, Oh man, you know, it still hits me. Don't get me wrong. It always mm -hmm. will. Um, but I am so proud of the person that Zoe was and i'm so proud of the energy that she is now um and i'm so grateful that i got to be her dad yeah. uh and and just the impact she had with so many people i couldn't tell you how many handwritten letters that i received from her hospital friends that that shared with me that zoe was the reason why they made it through the hospitalization i'm like there's there's no greater gift uh, yeah. uh, on this planet that's amazing. I love hearing that. And I love that you're able to share her story in such a beautiful way. Yeah. And you also do uh, kind of coaching now. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about, you know, where that kind of came from this need to kind of maybe help others going through something similar? Well, I, I found a way to get up and I didn't want another person to have to struggle to figure out how they were going to walk their journey and try to do it alone because we all need a guide. And so um, what started off a couple of years afterwards, as soon as I went to the story workshop, I came home and I started writing my book. And I just started recalling my experience of losing Zoe and then what I did in the months and the weeks, uh, the weeks and the months after I lost her. And, and I just wanted to share with people in the book that, hey, look, there are three paths that you can take. Uh, you can stay put. And that is a path. You can avoid it um, and stay stuck, or you can find your way and walk the path of healing and, and surviving this first, getting back up and then living beyond your loss. And it's possible. And I wanted to share with people how they could do that, you know, and, and, and again, giving guidance and, and just reassurance and permission uh, for those that don't feel like they deserve it, permission to figure it out as you go and to be easy on yourself uh, as much as possible. And so that led to working with um, coaching. Um, it, it led to where, where I would uh, get some outreach from people. Hey, I read your book. Uh, do you work with people one-on-one? -on -one? And uh, I, uh, I've been coaching for quite a while. And so this was kind of a natural progression into this. And so I started working with a, a leadership coach uh, because I think a lot of this journey involves self-leadership. You know, you have to lead yourself through this first before you can help other people. And so, but I can share my scars in the service of others through story and through lessons that I've learned so that they can then see that, okay, well, if, if, if they can do it, so can I, or it's not as, I don't have to have it all figured out at one time. And then when I started the coaching, that led to uh, a TEDx stage in 2018, and uh, now I'm in the process of working for with an on, uh, working on an online course, um, especially in the last year. Uh, it's so very much needed. Uh, I don't think that this is a, it's not a trend, 
right? We, we, as, a, as part of the human experience, we are going to have loss in our lives. And so I would just like to do everything in my power to both honor Zoe and to help anybody who is struggling with their loss to find their better days because we do deserve them. We don't deserve to live in darkness for the rest of our days because we didn't do one thing or say one thing that we think we should have. Um, it's okay. I love that. And I think um, you're right. It's, it's when you can work with someone, you know, I, there are a lot of people that claim they're a coach and sometimes I don't love the word coach because people just decide they want to be a coach when they have no sure. experience. I'm going to be a business coach, but I've never run a business. But your definition and what you're doing is a perfect example, right? I went through this myself mm. and I have figured out a way and it may not be, you know, everyone's way, but I get it. And I think to mm. me, that's a perfect example of like you're coaching in the right space because you're like, I've seen it. I get mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You can be that light of hope because when you are going through tough things, you do feel alone and you do yeah. feel frustrated and you're like, nothing's working. And mm -hmm. so making sure you have, like you said, someone that gets it because your loved ones may support you, but if they haven't been through that same thing, it's, it, they don't understand it in the same way, just as you described with your daughter, you know, right, she needed right. to be around other people going through right. that to help her yeah. in her way. So yeah. I love that you are doing that. If people want to learn more, they want to connect with you. Yes. Where is the best place to do that? You know, I, I really appreciate that, Carrie. Um, you know, I, I just am so honored that you uh, wanted me to come on and, and talk to your audience. And so I actually have a, a free gift for your audience. And so um, I've compiled a, um, a little 10-page guide to help you survive the loss of a loved one. <clears throat> and it's very simple to get to. All you have to do is go to grief uh, survival dot guide. And you can download this free, um, this free little ebook. And there's a lot of tips in there. There's a lot of do's and don'ts for how to navigate the shock of a loss. You know, what do you do about guilt? Um, what do you do when you start asking questions? Um, all of it. And so uh, I just wanted to be able to present that because, again, just as a gift for your audience. And and uh, that's probably the best way to reach out. And I do have a website um, uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if they have any questions, people can certainly reach out to me through that. And, uh, um, I'm sure that'll be in the, the show notes as well, but thank yeah. you so much for this. This has been fantastic. Yeah, no, this I is hope wonderful. It too. Yes, I think so. I, I, you know, we have these real, that's what this show is about. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. There's, you know, we hear about celebrities all the time. We have so many great people around us that are going through real life stuff. And when we mm -hmm. have these conversations, it helps us just feel again, more connected. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm really passionate about. So I thank you for being here. The last question I have for you, I ask all of my guests is what is one word or quote or mantra that you try to live by every single day? Fall down seven times and get up eight. It's an old Japanese proverb. And uh, that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in all of this, that life is going to knock you down. And so you have to just get up one more time every time. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being vulnerable, for sharing your story, for sharing just also some actionable steps and ways that people can kind of work through it. I appreciate you being here and I look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much, Carrie. So it's an honor. Thank you again.